Mics and Bienvenidos sean todos ustedes. Welcome everybody and uh, I am really glad to have this uh, particular uh, palomazo, this particular interview that we have tonight because we have the guest of honor is somebody too that I really admire the kind of work that he has been doing and he has been doing this kind of work not only in one mean, he, he has a lot of knowledge, he has been a co-creator and a showrunner of uh, one of the I, I dare to say a, a, a show that it was uh, way ahead of its time, perhaps be, before a lot of uh, people like to binge watch uh, television. And recently he uh, also released a, a really nice film that it's actually available here in Mexico if you, if you got uh, Amazon Prime in here. But, uh, and he has been writing very successfully a, a lot of series, uh, mainly for Dark Horse and also for Marvel Comics. And uh, allow me to introduce Christopher Canwell. How are you doing, Christopher? I'm good. How are you? It's good to see you. Excellent, excellent. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for accepting this, this invitation. As I mentioned before, I was like, I, I almost fell off uh, my chair when you say that, yeah, let's do it. So I'm really honored, <laughs> man. <laughs> well, hey, um, it's nice to be here. I mean, look, I'm sitting around. I'm, uh, I'm uh, off of a job and uh, it just wrapped up. And also, uh, you know, we're all hanging out at home as much as possible, given the current situation in the world. And um you know, my wife can watch the kids for a little bit. So all right, so I, I, this can this get can, on the computer. Yeah, this can help a little bit to to present a different kind of entertainment, if I dare to say it in in, in put in this position. So uh, just a little reminder: the main uh, transmission for this show will be uh, done at Twitch. Uh, you can join us at twitchtv churros y palomitas. And if you're watching this in Facebook, I am going to cut the transmission right now because we need you. Well, uh, it's it actually looks better if, if you go to Twitch in there. And I won't lie, I am going to show you guys uh, how it looks in there in a second, just so that you see that we are actually streaming in there. There you are. There we are. So, moving Check there. Check it out. And in Facebook, as I, I mentioned, in, in, at this very moment, I am just cutting the transmission in, in there. So, please join us in here. So, all right. Bye, Facebook. <laughs> exactly. This is, uh, yeah. we could say that this is a sort of a statement, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Excellent. So, okay. Finger. So, first of all, um, there have been uh, some series, and actually, if, if you guys uh, in the audience are uh, checking the streamings that are also in Twitch, uh, they are doing uh, uh, with Dark Horse. They are recommending some of the series. They are also having some uh, nice conversation with uh, some of the, the authors that they, they, they have in there. And uh, some of the series that uh, I was really intrigued, and uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, Christopher, at the beginning, uh, I started reading about your work in, comic, in the comic uh, book uh, format, uh, with Doctor Doom, and I have been really enjoying that series, and uh, I was really glad when they announced that you you got an animation. The entire the, the entire team got a nomination uh, for an editor for uh, for best best new series, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, no, that's correct. Excellent. I was surprised, but it's very cool. Yeah, no, it's it's like the Pulitzer Pulitzer for comics, so it's a great honor uh, yeah. just being. I think there. it's actually the first time my writing has been nominated for anything, so that's pretty cool. Excellent, excellent. So wh why don't we begin in there? Uh, you have a lot of experience, and uh, wh what was the first kind of, uh, in this case, uh, let's talk about, about uh, Doctor Doom. What was the, the, the pitch or the main idea that you had for this series, and has it changed or evolved as uh, it has continued? Um, yeah, I mean, the way that that came about was uh, I was introduced to Will Moss over at Marvel and uh, through Karen Berger, uh, my editor at Berger Books, uh, through Dark Horse, which is where her um, her larger imprint is right now. And, uh, you know, with Will, it was kind of a hi, nice to meet you email exchange. And then he wrote me out of the blue months later, and they were doing a kind of anthology series to go along with War of the Realms, their big crossover event. And the series was called War Scrolls, and it was basically little vignette stories of what other Marvel characters were up against during the whole uh, elf invasion of War of the Realms. And so Will reached out to me and said, do you want to do a you know 10-page story for an issue of the War of the Realms? And then that was included in um, um, War Scrolls. And that was my fir first Marvel anything. And uh, that came out. And then a few months after that, uh, Tom Brevert reached out to me, uh, an editor at Marvel, and 
said they were going to try to do a, a Doctor Doom series. And because I'd written that 10 page story, would I like to pitch on it? So I put together a pitch for Tom um, and he liked it. And we were kind of off to the races at that point. But I really threw everything I had into that pitch. I really wanted to I really wanted the job. So I wanted it to be great. And then I, I put together something that I think Tom was very excited about. And and look, we're we're doing I mean, like it, it you know, we had to stop at six because of everything that's going on with the pandemic. But, you know, it's written through 10. It's inked through 10 and being colored. So the series will return soon. And then I'm excited for people to see how this first, this, you know, this big story arc that we've been building um, concludes. Uh, it was cool to get the Eisner nomination and and for people to not even know where we're headed yet. And I think people will be really happy. I'm I'm really proud of the back issues. I think, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten I are very special to me. So I'm excited for people to see them. Excellent. And we're really looking forward to it. And uh, it's uh, in particular because you have been um, tackling this character. Uh, it's one of the most popular villains, uh, not, not only in comic book form, but also in, uh, I, I dare to say, in popular culture. Uh, because it, it's not like the um, classic uh, maniacal villain, or perhaps it can be, it depends obviously of, of the writer and the kind of focus that, that you can have it. And it has been in a kind of interesting evolution during the last years, because he had some sort of redemption, then he was, uh, when Bendis was writing him, uh, he was trying to fill the boy that was left uh, after the, the one of the many deaths of, uh, of Tony Stark and then uh, he came back to the basics and, and uh, I remember that at least uh, at the end of the run of um, of Vendis run with the, with the character um, I was like uh, well I know that the, after you finish the story you pretty much uh want to take back the toys to the to their boxes so the next writer can do something else. And uh, I was perhaps a little bit disappointed because I liked the kind of evolution. Then uh, we have the, the regular trial with the Fantastic Four and it was like, oh, you know, it's actually really funny. I, I like what the, they are doing in there. And then you, you are here presenting something that it's actually continuing because you have, a, at least for uh, the, the perception that I have, is that uh, you dealt a little bit more into the psychology of the person, uh, of the character. And then uh, you don't deny any of these things. I mean, uh, we can still uh, see some uh, some parts of the uh, classical uh, egomaniac character that doesn't uh, doesn't care about the opinions or the corrections that somebody uh, wants to say. Uh, but he's also obviously in his own world. He's a hero, and I really love how it, the story begins uh, when we have an incident in the moon, and he was uh, pretty much warning, and everybody was like, well, "You are just jealous uh, about the the, the, <laughs> the brains of the other guys." So I'm really look, looking forward uh, for how this comes. Where, where did, the, did the idea about this kind of conflict came? And uh, also, can you mention, uh, talk a little bit about the inclusion of, uh, uh, at one time it was believed to be the future version of Doom, uh, but this is more like his conscious run, uh, right now with Kanker the Conqueror. Kang the Conqueror, sorry. Right. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think you're hitting the nail on the head in that, you know, when we started the story, you've got a character whose name is Dr. Doom, so you can, you can immediately be Arch, uh, and t too much so, in my opinion. But you you also want to be true to the character, which is that kind of you know didactic, big kind of operatic performance of that character. But you always want to try to ground him in in today, and also make him relatable, but also not soften him too much, and then also not have him be just two dimensional, and not have him just be a nice guy to you know do something different. So you know, drilling down into exactly what you said, which is that he thinks of himself as a hero, I think was key to the beginning of the story. And then also the way I approach it and the way I've been thinking about the character is that to me, Dr. Doom is, um, he's both Dr. Frankenstein and the monster. Yeah. So he's both things. Like he kind of made himself this monstrosity and he's also the brilliant scientist. Um, I think approaching the character from that place um, really helped me. Um, and then also, you know, I like to beat up characters and stories. I think when you really challenge them and put them up against the wall, um, that's when they do, you know, really interesting things and prove their real metal. So, you know, I wanted to take away what Doom had at the very beginning and also have everyone just believe he was this horrible villainous person just kind of doing the things he does. And yet, you know, he's framed at the beginning. So for him to lose his kingdom, his country, his his kind of regal power and bring him down to just guy on the street with his, you know, 
sorcerer abilities, his scientific know-how, but that's it. And there's a lot of people who don't like him in the world. Um, what does he do to get back? And, and, and because he's a character that is, you know, he's, he is a monarch of a country. It was also fun to tell that kind of geopolitical story that was going on back in Latveria and really explore that in a way that I felt um, would be new. You know, does that make sense? Where it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like we could do the stories of coups and, and takeovers and Southern borders and regions and kind of backroom dealings and what you would see in a, you know, any country in the world, especially something in the Balkan states where Latveria is supposed to be, and and discovering the idea of of Simcaria, the other kind of fictionalized marginal uh, uh, Marvel company that that that's been created, Marvel country that's been created, having that be right underneath and exploring the the relationships between two countries was another fun part of the story for me. So, so at one hand you got the the raw guy that you can kind of strip out of his armor and bring down to his very big basics. And then over here you have this um, kind of Iron Curtain uh, collision of sorts, right? Where there's espionage and there's sabotage and there's, um, you know, traitors and, and all kinds of stuff. And I think that, that all that stuff is very fun to kind of meld together. That all feels like, you know, of doom to do those kinds of things. Exactly, and uh, there's also a, a nice combination in, in the different kind of genres in here because, uh, well, uh, we have, as you mentioned, the monarch, we have the political intrigue in there. Then uh, as the series uh, advances, we could say that we have also some sort of sci-fi urban uh, action thriller in there while he's trying mm -hmm. to recover part of of, uh, of himself in a way. Then he's a runaway, uh, he's a runaway, a, a runaway hero in, in his own eyes, uh, uh, while he also ha tries to deal not only with um, the, the skepticism of the people because uh, for the rest of the world, he's a villain. In this case, there's a particular uh, situation that you already mentioned, the, the, the conflict that it's uh, in these uh, two countries that are in, uh, at the moment at war. You, you have the political intrigue in there. But also, you have... Uh, I, I really love the kind of interactions that uh, we have. I believe it's in issue two. Uh, when uh, we have uh, some familiar characters like Doctor Strange and then uh, Doom uh, at the end of uh, issue first... Oops, spoiler. Uh, he mm -hmm. do something to save the rest of the people to save his country because he's something that he really cares about. He surrenders and uh, then you have the interaction in this case with um, with uh, Doctor Strange that says, well, uh, how, how, how do I know that I can trust you? And he's like, well, you know, I actually, you can do it because I swear on my mother's soul and that, that, that should mean something to you in the same way that these people mean something to me. And you also saw, uh, show it in, in the rest of the series because uh, we, ca we get a peek of the interaction that he has with some of the people that he respects that have been part of, in this case, of the of the inner circle, uh, to put it in one way, mm -hmm. uh, it, it could be perhaps some sort of the family. So uh, when you were thinking about these characters, secondary characters, were there any kind of uh, specific profiles that you were looking so that you could, you could build a better uh, Victor Bandum? Well, I think that, you know, what I wanted to do was do a ton of research first, right? So even when I was building out the pitch, I went back and read issue upon issue of Doom stories, you know, stretching all the way back to the 60s. So that would be like the first time that Doom was deposed. Right. Uh, and then then there was the really fascinating story where he comes back to the Fantastic Four and essentially asks for their help in getting his country back because the man who deposed him has, you know, completely destroyed the country and almost become a worse despot than than he was. Right. And, and the Fantastic Four kind of reluctantly help him reclaim his throne. It's almost this weird. It's kind of like this weird kind of American support of totalitarian regimes that they think are okay storyline that I thought was really fascinating. And then to go through, you know, triumph and torment, uh, the story of, you know, doom and, and strange in hell trying to rescue his mother's soul, um, to go through the Brubaker books, um, uh, books of doom to read all these things and to learn all this backstory. He has such interesting relationships with certain characters and so when he does say, I swear on my mother's soul, I mean, he knows he knows Strange knows what he's talking about because they were there together when they were trying to do that, right? And, mm -hmm. and you know, he did try to leave Strange in hell and, and he, he did it again after that. And, you know, he sent Valeria there in order to become more powerful. And, and so you play with all of those things. And 
you don't want to write a story that's completely referential of what's happened in the past, but some of those things are just so emotionally resonant that as long as a, a new reader can pick up the book and understand that there's some sort of connection between Doom and whoever he's talking to, whether it's Doctor Strange, whether it's uh, Morgan Le Fay, whether it's Kang, um, if you can write it in a way where you understand there's 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 history there, there's connection there, there's a lot of ambiguity in the way that the characters feel about each other. I think even a, a brand new reader could pick up the book and 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 sense that in the pages. Um, and then you know, for for huge fans of the character that have followed him for years, they can go, oh, that's you know, he did have a relationship with Morgan Le Fay. Oh, he did try to leave Doctor Strange in Hell. Um, oh, that's right, he might be related to Kang, but it's never been figured out. You know, those types of things. And so to play with those, um, you know, helps infuse the drama i think it also is satisfying for fans and then going back to the character having a tendency to be arch if you can play with them lightly i think it brings in a nice feeling of humor when it's needed so that the whole thing doesn't feel dry and melodramatic and and over the top as long as it's kind of treating itself with um a tongue-in-cheek at times carefully it remains fun if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, as you mentioned, part of the research, um, there, there are also some parts that perhaps haven't been written uh, or perhaps they have been because they are uh, looked uh, up in the future, like uh, Doom uh, 2099 series. And I was just rereading that part uh, because one of the main elements that we find in, in, in your series in this interaction uh, with Kang is that Kang uh, it's, it's trying to help Doom, but not for uh doom's sake but because it's an element that it's going to play in his in his bigger plot and uh, one of the things that he mentioned is that well you know that for a fact you are going to be i mean i i know for a fact that you are going to be uh, a great ruler and uh, you combine this with the elements of the visions that uh, doom has been uh, seeing about perhaps his life in an alternative reality where he's finally happy when where he has a family where we we had some kind of peaks on this kind of reality, in this case in the Secret Wars events with uh, Jonathan Hickman, where he had the family, but we had the family that he stole, in, in this case, from uh, Red Richards. And in this case, no, it's uh, his own story. It's the story that he had. Uh, he hasn't reached yet, but there are some elements. And then you have this combination because, well, as we mentioned, um, uh, Kang the Conqueror mentions that he's an instrument perhaps for a, a, a bigger plot. But then we have the reference. In this case, uh, Doom was a ruler and uh, he actually took uh, over America, if I remember well, in the 2099 series. So perhaps he's referring uh, to this series or perhaps he's referring to something else, right? I don't know. Perhaps he's the yeah, I think that, I mean, uh, No, I think that, uh, right, so Doom's having these visions mm -hmm. that he, he doesn't understand and these visions are of himself totally fine. Um, he's a benevolent ruler he's kind of completely unified earth and disarmed it it's a very peaceful kind of utopian vision he has he has a family he's married he has two sons and he's really troubled by them um just because of the allure of them right it's completely different from the life he has and he starts to meet each of these characters that he has a history with and some of them seem to have seen the same things so kang when he shows up, he's seen a future in which Doom is a benevolent, happy ruler. And, you know, Kang's reasoning is, I want to help you get there because that's going to be a very easy earth for me to conquer. Is one that's very soft and peaceful and everything is kind of perfect. And if, I'd, if, if I'm able to take over that earth, you know, I'll be incredibly happy as opposed to a terrible earth from the 31st century or a war-ridden earth from, you know, earlier in our own history. So Kang has seen it, you know, in issue three, Modoc makes reference to having seen these things. Um, other characters have had these visions. Mephisto makes reference to having seen some of these things. And then, you know, where we're headed is that it all has to do with this black hole that's been created over the moon, right? Is that something within the creation of that black hole is causing a distortion in either the future, this reality, a different reality. And it's not just Doom that's seeing it. It's other people who have relationships with Doom are starting to see this possible future of him as this benevolent ruler of a unified Earth. And everybody starts to become invested in it for their own reasons, where I think 
Kang obviously thinks of it as a prize, you know, and then Modoc being the genius that he is, I think is almost won over by the beauty of that vision. Um, and is trying to push Victor towards, um, making that a reality. Um, and then you have, uh, Mephisto, you know, essentially the devil who's seen it and, and wants, wants it to not happen because he's always wanted doom's soul. Right. And, and he doesn't want, um, such a, a pure kind of existence to happen on earth because it's a threat to his rule as, you know, king of the underworld in a certain way. So all of these characters are reacting to these visions that they're clearly all having, but we're really only seeing it through the eyes of doom and doom's ambivalence about the visions changes, you know, from issue to issue, you know, they make him upset. They make him, um, they, they show him something that maybe he privately wants. Um, because another thing I believe about Victor is that he is able to love, he loves his people. He's loved people in the past. He feels, um, I think that he feels he is unable to be loved. I think that there's a damage there in that character, you know, stemming from his mother, stemming from his father, people who did love him died. Um, he's done so many horrible things. He's viewed as such a awful villain by so many people in the world that I think he, he feels that uh, he's not worthy of love. And so to see a future where he's married happily, where he has children who love him, where he has people in the world who support him and want him to be their leader I think he's in disbelief. It makes him furious because he doesn't know how to get from here to there. Um, and then there are times when he just wants it to happen. He's, he's kind of gives himself over to it privately at times saying, what do I need to do in order to, to have that? I want that. Right. And I think a lot of us, if you're given a glimpse of your future and, and your future is fantastic, but so fantastic that you have no idea how to change your life now in order to get to that place that can be really frustrating and really disorienting. Right. And I think that, I mean, you look at the world today, right. Where, where there are glimpses of change and radical change where things could be fantastic, whether it be in America, whether it be in the legal system, whether it be, uh, um, you know, in the way that we, we address things in our society or the way that we um, approach our food or our environment. And then at the same time, you're washing your hands and you're throwing away plastic and you're watching history repeat itself on TV, whether it be in the form of, um, you know, clashes between, you know, like a police and poor communities or, or, or communities of color or uh, black communities, or you see, you know, yet another report about environmental damage. And you wonder how the hell are we going to get from here to that really wonderful place that we can all imagine. And so when Doom can't stop imagining a wonderful future for himself, it's like something that's, you know, it could drive him crazy. And I think that's what we're going to go through in the next few issues. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, perhaps uh, one of the greatest uh, ways that you can, uh, I don't know, uh, deal with one of uh, your enemies is perhaps giving them hope uh, and then take it away. And this is some of the parts, some of the elements that he never he never knew and uh, that he started to feel like they, they, it were close uh, to him, making him vulnerable in this case. Uh, mm -hmm. One uh, really fast comment from uh, people from the audience. Uh, Twitter, uh, Gabi Carvajal says, I'm going to read it in Spanish and uh, make the translation mm -hmm. después. Uh, dile que amo Halt and Catch Fire con toda mi vida y que merecía más reconocimiento uh, Halt and Catch Fire is uh, the love of her life and it, uh, it really deserved a, a, a lot of recognition so. oh that's nice that's great thank you very much I'm glad I'm glad more people continue to find that show and, and um, you know people have been there people who have been there since the beginning are, are, are very special to me but the more that people find it on streaming services and the fact that it's still on Netflix and that people are still talking about it you know almost uh, three years after it's gone off the air um, matters a lot to me. And I know to my partner, Chris Rogers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the work that you made in there, uh, I mean, it, it's not uh, gratuitous, gratuitous when when we say that it's a critically acclaimed and also loved by the audience. So it's not just the, the critics that uh, happen to watch this and like. So I uh, believe that uh, we are we really enjoy that. So since we mentioned a little bit about the series and you mentioned also, uh, I, I mean, like the Catch and Halt, uh, Halt and Catch Fire, uh, did you focus in, in, in the pitch that you had for Doctor Doom uh, because of the number of issues 
issues that you have planned, uh, did you try to do it uh, like uh, a season of a TV show or something like that? Or is it something that is uh, completely unrelated? Well, you know, it was good to me to, to plan for a long um, single story arc, uh, you know, with She Could Fly. I planned for four. And then we were fortunate enough to do another five issues in a second series mm -hmm. for She Could Fly. Um, and I think, you know, I was putting together everything, my book, everything after that. And that was a, that was a pitch for 10. Um, but, but really I think, you know, Marvel and, and Tom Brevert wanted me to lay out kind of where we're going. And the, the thing that was new for me with Marvel was, um, you know, we don't know how well we're going to do in the market and, and on the, in the, the big two, you know, books, books may not necessarily last as long as you plan them to story-wise. So I was looking for ways to kind of put in small buttons if we needed to end early. Um, but ultimately, I just tried to write the hell out of it and hope to God that people bought it enough that we would continue to tell the whole story. And it was funny, I think in the back of my mind, I was always afraid that something was going to happen and stop the story from being told all the way through. And then we had the pandemic and all of comics shut down. And I was like, here it is. Told you. Like going to my therapist and being like, see, the end of the world. We're here. Um, but it was actually amazing that we were very lucky. Uh, the industry was that it was only for a few months. And to find out that Doom is coming back, you know, fairly soon is really happy for me just because we'll be able to tell the full story that I wanted to tell. But but yeah, I episodic television does help in terms of plotting out what's going to happen when I think if anything, I, I think something I work against is, is trying to cram too much into an issue of comics. It really just has to be kind of a single note that you're hitting in a book very well and doing light variations on. And then it, it's kind of over. You can't really cram a ton of plot into there. And I think I'm getting better at that as I, as I continue on in my comics career is to just like focus on that kind of, what is that singular musical note in the melody that you can kind of just play on a few keys and, you know, hit some dissonance, hit some harmonies, and then just kind of be out of the issue and, and not, not short shrift any plot, um, you know, not confuse the audience. Um, it's tricky, you know, but uh, with TV, you can obviously do more in an episode, but I think the, the simpler an episode of TV the better the episode of TV. I, I've always felt that, but I, I, I am guilty. I think my biggest problem as a writer is overwriting. I just get super excited. And then, you know, there's this idea of scope creep, right? Where like the, the story grows on its own and becomes too big and too unwieldy and you want to include everything. And then you start sacrificing things that are more important and you start prioritizing the wrong thing. And then the whole thing can kind of just fall apart. But uh, it's something I'm constantly struggling against. But the simpler I can keep it, the better. And that seems to work every time, whether it be TV or comics. Yeah, yeah. And also because uh, in that way you can explore, uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, it, it might look simple, but it actually helps to develop uh, uh, aspects that uh, can make more meaningful for the viewer because it's something that you, it's easier to relate if we're speaking about a character or a situation, uh, then uh, it's easier that, uh, to relate to that, that, that something like really complicated, like, I don't know, the moon exploring, exploding, <laughs> something like that, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. So um, you mentioned a, a little bit, and I want to mention. Uh, whoa! Well, as I mentioned before, Christopher, uh, uh, per perhaps if uh, possible, we could do a follow up later uh, at a later date uh, uh, about this because I was discovering some of the other work that you mentioned. And for example, I just got the chance to read the first issue of uh, She Could Fly. Uh, it published a couple of seasons uh, with Berger Books, which is well, Karen Berger. I believe that it's if if not one of the most important, the most important editor that has been for the maturity of the comic book form and also the one that I have been really enjoying and I believe I am up to issue five it's everything and it actually helped to name this episode I usually like to name it with part of the work of, of one of the authors and I was like uh, what can I talk with Christopher about and I was like well you can talk about pretty much everything so <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about, about the inspiration because it's I really love that it's uh, kind of fun um a really crazy story, but the, with a really human touch, because we're talking about something that is really is really present at the moment. Uh, we are uh, 
talking about businesses. We're talking about the, the, the way that we can be manipulated. Uh, for some moments, it kind of reminds me some of the work of Grant Morrison uh, in Sea Guy, for example. Uh, Thank but you. Uh, but uh, can you tell us a little bit more, more about everything? Yeah, I mean, that, that was a really fun idea. I think that first off, I mean, we, you know, I did She Could Fly with Karen and we had a, a wonderful time. That was my first comic book experience. It was just wonderful from soup to nuts, you know, working with Karen, working with Martin Marazzo, working with Miroslav, um, you know, uh, Karen's assistant, um, Ray, you know, Richard Bruning, her husband does the design of these gorgeous books, you know, all of the, the logos, you know, the layouts. Um, and then Mike Richardson and everybody at, at Dark Horse was really fantastic. You know, and I, I read Dark Horse as a kid, so it was just a dream come true. And, and we had such a good experience that Karen, you know, and I started talking about what we could do next. And, you know, I thought about it for a while and I think it was, man, it was probably already two years ago that I came up with the idea for everything, which was, um, you know, I used to go to the, the, the mall with my mom all the time when I was a kid and you just kind of get lost in these big, you know, shopping centers, you go to, you know, Sears or you go to Dillard's or you go to Target and, and, they feel so huge when you're a kid and just kind of endless. And then you look at stores online now, like Amazon, right? Or eBay, where it's literally the everything store, right? You can get anything on, uh, you know, on Amazon and it, to a point where it's a little alarming, you know, and, and my wife, Elizabeth, who is, um, she is a writer in her own right. She's a poet. Uh, and she always used to think about a store called the everything store, that sold everything. And so, you know, I was like, can I please uh, call something that I'm working on that and, and kind of put all these, put all these ideas into one book. And, and we put it in the past, it's set in 1980 so that we could have a brick and mortar store. I didn't want to do an online version of it. Right. We wanted to have the feel of an actual place that sells everything. And I also wanted to hearken back to the Sears catalogs, you know, that go all the way back to the, you know, late 1800s, but, you know, through the 1980s, were these incredibly rich tomes of everything. You know, you could get a chainsaw, you could get a nightgown, you could get some and irons, you know, like, and so all of that stuff being this kind of um, almost religious experience for people. I remember going through research with Karen and finding this, this ad for a Kmart that was coming to somewhere in like Ohio. And it's a, a, a guy is putting up a billboard for, for a new Kmart and it says, coming soon and all these people from the town have come out to this field like it's a pilgrimage and there's even a woman pushing like holding a baby and they're looking up at the billboard like we can't wait for this incredible consumer experience that we can worship and so i think that was the hyperbole i i took into the story and you know this everything store opens in in a, a small town in michigan and everybody's very excited um but there are some characters on the fringe of the town that are a little bit more confused or distant from the story. Um, you know, the main, one of the main characters is a woman named Lori, who is a recent transplant. She's not from the small town. She has a, a kind of, you know, weird past that she doesn't talk to anybody about. She seems to be kind of an alcoholic. She lives alone. Um, she has a very boring job, but she doesn't really, she's not really connecting with the vibrance of the store um, the city manager, you know, is a very kind of well-to-do, his family goes back generations in the town and uh, he's very excited about it, but at the same time, something seems to be off. And then certain psychic disturbances start happening in the, uh, in the, in the town and, and people start to have very strange experiences and then people start to die. And then people start to wonder what's going on with some of the employees and, it's kind of this weird, creepy, slow build that we do until we really just um, start to take the cap off and go crazy with it. And, you know, characters start having visions and, and all kinds of stuff. And, and the one sad thing about the pandemic is issue five is the last one in that arc. And, and that, that, that arc is called Grand Opening. And then the second arc is called Black Friday. And, and I and Jay Colbert, Colbert, the artist, um, me and Karen... And, and Richard have been working on the back arc and that stopped because of the pandemic the, the you know, issue number six was supposed to come out in April and it couldn't. Um, unfortunately that, that will now just come out as a full trade paperback, but it won't come out until like March of next year. 
So hopefully people won't have forgotten about the book because the first five issues are like, oh, this creepy store, what's going on? It's kind of more of an undercurrent. But then in the second, in the second book, things go absolutely crazy. Like it's just going to be mm. back. Yet. Like I think people will, <laughs> I think people will not see where it's going. And I think there'll be um, a lot of, a lot of fun to be had with what is actually behind the power of the store and what the real story is. And there's some really fun sci-fi elements that I built with I and J and the art. And, um, you know, we got to wait a long time, but, but it'll be worth it. I hope. Yeah, yeah. And I, I really enjoy the, the kind of style because you can feel that it's a, a particular book, perhaps the kind of books that you can only get in, uh, in this case, in Berger books. And they are not paying me for saying that. But uh, you, as you mentioned, that the, the way that uh, they have the, uh, st stylized the, the, the pages, you have an identity. In previous issues, for example, you, you got, let me just find an example here, uh, something similar, for example, to a catalog. And it's a part mm -hmm. that is not just uh, there uh, gratuitously. It's, it's part of the story. It helps you get into the narrative. After all, we, we have perhaps... It, it, it was one of the classic villains from the 80s. Uh, the, 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 it was the businessman and the big corporation. And then in the 90s, uh, it, it changed. And uh, we were trying to get free from uh, from this. And we were trying to rebel. So there's a, some sort of combination of these elements where you have also have the comfort of the people who are living in this case, in this universe. And it's, it's something that uh, I believe that really reflects what we have right now, even with the pandemic, because... If you are lucky enough to have a job and if you are lucky enough to, 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 to order pretty much everything, the, the biggest uh, complaint that you can have is that, well, you know, uh, I can order it from Amazon and instead of getting uh, here by tomorrow, it will be in one week. Oh, wow. That's a, 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 a terrible disgrace. Uh, we right. are really spoiled in that way. So it's, it's yeah. also a, a, um, a criticism to the way that we are being um, treated in this case by the, the 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 very things that we are looking for that the very things that we are wanting. Yes, absolutely. I think it, you know the, the whole idea of being kind of a slave to your consumer tendencies is is a big part of the story and and you know something that freaks me out just as much as you know everything else because you know as much as we were talking about a wonderful future you know driving someone mad like you know Victor Von Doom. I think we also get promised these wonderful futures by companies like, you know, Amazon or Facebook. And, and, and we have to kind of wait and stop and look and go, well, wait a minute. Like, what are we giving up? What are we trading for, you know, two day shipping, you know, and, and, and in halt and catch fire, we did that with computers, right? Which is like, mm -hmm. we're going to make computers. It's going to be great. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to save the world. We're going to change everything. And you know, they did, but there's no going back, right? We can't we can't hit an off switch on the internet and be like, oh, you know what? Let's uh, let's go back and uh, retool some things. Um, you're like, we're in. You know, like everybody has a phone in their pocket. Everybody's looking at stuff online 24/7. I mean, the cool thing is you and I can do this, but at the same time, like I could also just like ignore my kids on my phone and just you know fight with people on Twitter from all over the world for the rest of the evening. You know what I mean? Or and not go to bed and then order. You know. 70 million things on Amazon that I don't need and, you know, destroy, like have the, have the, the, the shipping boats and, and, and vans just cut a, a sword swath through the, through the upper atmosphere with the, you know, the CO2 emissions and then have the poor employee at the warehouse, you know, run around and, and, and work overtime trying to get the package in the van and the van driver driving there and everybody's exposed to COVID Potentially every time they go to the front door or when they walk across the room to and pass their, you know, fellow employees and, and uh, it becomes quite dystopian. As soon, as soon as you start to look at it like that, you're like, oh, my God, we've destroyed ourselves and there's no going back. Um, so, yeah, so there's two sides to every coin, I guess, or uh, one one dark, one light. But uh, uh, amazing innovation, I think, uh, and breakthrough also brings about some really cautionary tales that you have to be careful of. And I think whether it be a store or whether it be quote unquote saving the world, you know, what, what does that mean for everybody involved and, and who's going to be affected negatively by it?
you know. Mm -hmm. what, what's the cost after all? Because uh, everything ha has consequences. And for example, one of the either to say secondary characters in this case uh, that, that is always present in there, it's just an uh, animated character or well, inanimated, unanimated, but it's, actu it's actually it can be the, the voice of the consciousness, but it also can be the voice of, of comfort, the kind of comfort that we we want to, to have. Uh, you, you, you made uh, an excellent uh, comparison in there because for everybody, pretty much uh, we have a powerful computer uh, at reach and with that we can pretty much block everything and if we want to find the support of somebody uh, the, the support of the ideas that we have it's really easy to find it doesn't matter if it's a terrible idea somebody else is going to think think alike and it will give you the kind of uh perhaps a kind of uh, comfort because you feel that you are not the only one but also if you are thinking about um Uh, about uh, things that are not as convenient. If you are focusing in, in, in that you are the hero, but you are actually the bad guy if, uh, in the politics, in, in economics, in whatever, uh, they're, they're, you are going to find their voices that are going to, or at least you are going to believe that they are there for, for, to support you, and then you are going to feel justified, and it's uh, one of the terrible consequences that we have in this case. Well, in, yeah, in, in this absolutely. Yeah, you, there's, good, there's good and bad of all of these things, and, and, and that's you have to be... You just have to be mindful as you move forward, whether it's, you know, your shopping habits or whether you want to create a company that, you know, is some sort of social media giant, like mm. a lack of mindfulness can really bite you in the ass, right? If you just march blindly forward as fast as you can, you might end up making more of a mess than you realize. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly guilty of that, I think. We all are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Absolutely. All right. So uh, I, I really love to continue this conversation. However, let's uh, finish this perhaps first episode and hopefully we, we can continue later in there. And uh, if people want to contact you, I believe that is really easy. I mean, it's the way that I did it uh, with a couple of tweets. Uh, you can find uh, Christopher Canwell and uh, if you can't well, there you can find it in Twitter. So uh, uh, you can read, the, uh, uh, read him in there and then uh, you can also tweet, tweet at him. And if you want to read a little bit more, Uh, I mentioned everything. I have really enjoyed this series. I'm looking forward for the following issues in there. It's uh, sold by Dark Horse. You can also get it in there uh, if you want it in, in Comixology. So don't worry if you are not it's, it's not available at uh, your nearest comic store that they are uh, reopening. Thankfully, you can get it in digital format. There, uh, you also have She Could Fly. Uh, this is a homework that I have for myself because I really enjoyed the first issue, but uh, I have uh, two seasons to to, to mm -hmm. enjoy in there. Uh, if you want, want something more mainstream, well, we have already mentioned Dr. Doom uh, in, in, in the first part of this show. However, if you are located in Mexico because, uh, well, this, this, the show is, it's kind of funny because most of the audience is in the United States and in mm -hmm. Ukraine. I don't know why, perhaps both. Ukraine, nice. Hey, Ukraine, what's up? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny because I am serious. It's United States, Mexico, Ukraine, and then the rest of the country. So somebody in there, uh, perhaps a bot farm, it's in there uh, watching this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you want to watch, perhaps, and I recommended this in a previous show that we had, the part you lose, uh, las cosas que pierdes, you can find it and you can buy it or rent it in uh, Prime Video. Uh, it's uh, uh, a movie that uh, I perhaps I have uh, something to discuss in there, but uh, perhaps for a future show because it's described as a thriller. But for me, it was more like a coming of age story. It's, it was just my my my, my perception, but that's perhaps. I agree with you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, you just killed the topic that I had for a few dreams. <laughs> Well, the point is that you can get it in there in, pre in Prime Video and also, uh, unfortunately, in here we don't have in Netflix uh, your show. You can get it uh, on Blu-ray or on DVD or in, perhaps in apocryphal media, as I, I dare to call it. It, it might be available on Amazon. I'm not sure about Mexico or mm -hmm. Ukraine, but uh, I know it's on Amazon, on, on Amazon here in uh, the States. Exactly, you can get it in there. So uh, something else that you want me to plug to recommend or perhaps some final words uh, for the audience? I I don't want to jinx it, but tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern, there should be some pretty big comic news that I'm very excited about. That's finally going to be announced, and it'll be it'll be the biggest announcement I've had for comics yet. So nice. stay tuned. Hopefully, I didn't just say that, and then they'll call and go, "Oh, you know, sorry, we can't do it tomorrow." But uh, um, yeah. So uh, I can't say anything else. But that's uh, that's tomorrow. 
All right, so stay tuned, and uh, obviously uh, we have already mentioned the, me the means where you can follow the news about that. Some final uh, comments from the audience. Uh, we have already mentioned about the, the people that love uh, your, your your show, and also. <laughs> Well, this, this was a technical detail because they were mentioning that my audio levels are a little bit lower than the ones from uh, Mr. Cute. So I believe that they are referring to you. So there you have the comment. Okay, Mr. Cute. I'll take it. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you very much to everybody who has been watching in, uh, this uh, transmission. And especially, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chris. Uh, it was a, a blast. And believe me, I, I really want to continue with the conversation. So perhaps we will be able to do it in a, a not so far future. That sounds great. No, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It's been fun talking. All right. And uh, also, thanks to all the patrons that we have. Yes, we have a Patreon uh, for this page. And if you find some kind of value on the kind of uh, things that we are uh, providing in here, podcast, uh, video interviews, and also editorial content, remember that you can give uh, some value in exchange in patreon.com slash churros y palomitas. And if you can't, don't worry. Uh, we uh, can accept uh, human sacrifices or something like that, especially money. Don't worry. Though you don't have to, to sacrifice something, like, uh, something that it's uh, there to you. Or you can just share the links uh, with your friends. Uh, so perhaps they, 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 uh, they, we can start a pyramidal scheme and they can uh, give us some support. So, okay. Uh, that's uh, all for that. Thanks for you all guys watching. And thanks, Christopher. It was a real blast. Hey, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Take care. All right. And we are back, and in this case, it's used for a brief recommendation, perhaps something to read, something to watch, something to, I don't know, something to practice in case that's a sport or something like that. Uh, do you have a recommendation for, for us, Chris? Yeah, uh, boy, I could give you one of each. Let's see. Um, in terms of reading, um, you know, the, the best, um, some of the best series I'm reading right now that I think came back yesterday for New Comic Book Day, uh, Ice Cream Man um, by W. Maxwell Prince. Uh, drawn by Martin Morazzo, who did She Could Fly. Uh, and then also Something is Killing the Children, um, which is uh, 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 James Tinney in the fourth. He's uh, the current Batman writer right now, I believe. Uh, mm -hmm. That book is fantastic. It's like it's like if Stranger Things pulled no punches whatsoever. <laughs> I love it. Um, and then watching, I, I'll give you, I'm just trying to think of a really weird movie to watch. Uh, oh, uh, <laughs> if you want to... Uh, if you want to get really sad, there's a movie called Scarecrow from 1973 hmm. starring uh, Al Pacino and Gene Hackman. They're both uh, vagabonds. They kind of meet on the side of a road. They decide they're going to work together and uh, uh, start a car wash together based on um, Gene Hackman's plans. They kind of become friends, but they go from uh, California to Denver to um, Detroit where they need to meet up with some of Al Pacino's family, no spoilers, um, with the plan to get the money in, uh, in, in um, Pittsburgh. And it's beautiful. It won the Grand Prix, I think, at uh, Cannes mm -hmm. uh, back in the day. No one saw the movie in the theater. It bombed. It's really sad. Um, it's really beautiful. I cried at the end. It's a rough movie to watch, but it's incredible.